Hello everyone. This is part two of the Schedule Pro tutorial video series that covers the example presented in Chapter 4 of the Schedule Pro Manual. Please make sure to watch part one of this video tutorial series before watching this video. Furthermore, remember to visit our website at www.intelligen.com where you can download an evaluation version of Schedule Pro. Let's now continue the tutorial where we left off. As you may recall, in Part 1 we stopped after the addition of the first operation in Procedure P1. Therefore, we need to add the rest of the operations for the procedures in order to complete this recipe. In addition, at this point it is important to mention that due to the interdependent nature of operation scheduling, it is usually easier to first declare all procedures and operations in the recipe and then visit each operations properties dialog to declare the scheduling details. Therefore, we will now proceed to add the additional operations to our three procedures. Beginning with procedure P1, we need to add five more operations. To add an operation, simply click on the Add New Operation button and then give your operation a name. We can change the name of the second operation in this procedure to Charge Sodium Chloride. In a similar manner, we're going to add the charge of the API. We will also add a mixing operation. a transfer to a storage tank, and finally our cleaning operation. Next, let's select procedure P2 and add its respective operations. Let's first select operation 1 and change its name to Receive from Mix Tank. Now let's add two more operations. The first one we will name Feed Filler. And the second one will be the cleaning operation called Clean Tank. These are all the operations that we will need for this procedure, so let's proceed to P3. In this last procedure, we will need two operations. We can change the name of the first one to Fill Bags. And the second will be a cleaning operation called Clean Filler. These are all the operations necessary for this recipe, so our next step is to initialize them. Let's begin with P1. The first operation in this sequence, charge water, has already been initialized, so let's proceed to our second operation, charge sodium chloride. Note that an operations dialog box can be opened in two different ways. One way is to select it and click the Edit Operation button. An alternate way is to simply double click on the operation, as I will do now. For this operation, we need to change the duration to 15 minutes. Notice that through this dialog, there are various options to specify the duration. We will discuss these options as we go along. Let's now proceed to the Scheduling tab. With regards to scheduling, it is important to mention that the first operation of a procedure is by default scheduled to start at the beginning of a batch. All other operations within the procedure are by default scheduled to start at the end of their previous operation. This default operation sequence can be modified if desired. However, in the case of this sodium chloride operation, the, de the default sequence in which the charge of sodium chloride has been automatically scheduled at the end of the charge water operation is the correct sequence. Note that the scheduling tab also offers options that allow us to relate the start time or end time of an operation to the start time or end time of other operations in another procedure. We will come back to this concept later. Now that we have initialized this operation, we can either click OK and then select the next operation in the list to edit it, or we can use these buttons to navigate through the operations. 
Let's click OK Next Operation in order to go directly to the next operation. As you can see, we are now viewing the operation properties for the third operation in our sequence, which is the charge API operation. For this operation, we need to change the duration to 15 minutes. Furthermore, this operation will need to follow the previous operation, which is the default option as mentioned earlier. Therefore, let's proceed to the next operation. The next operation is the mixing operation, which will take 60 minutes. Since the duration of operations is by default set to one hour, we don't need to change anything through this tab. Furthermore, mixing will begin after we charge the API, which is the default scheduling option. Therefore, we can continue on to the next operation, transfer to storage. Here, we need to change the duration to 30 minutes. In terms of scheduling, this operation will begin immediately after the mixing operation. As a result, we don't need to change anything here. Let's now proceed to the final operation, which is the cleaning operation. For the duration, we need to adjust the time to 90 minutes. As for scheduling, we will again keep the default sequence, which states that this operation will follow the transfer to storage operation. Furthermore, since this is a cleaning operation, we need to specify the use of a CIP skid, which we can do through the Auxiliary Equipment tab. Through this tab, you can add auxiliary equipment by selecting it from the list of available equipment, and then clicking on the Add button to add it to the auxiliary equipment pool. By doing so, we are now telling the program that this operation will require a CIP skid for its execution. In this way, we can also track the CIP skid's occupancy. Let's now click OK to finalize the operation definitions for P1. Notice that the durations of the various operations now correspond to the values that we specified. Also notice that CIP skid 1 now appears on the auxiliary equipment column for the cleaning operation. Let's now proceed to initialize the operations for procedure P2. We can start with the first operation, Receive from Mix Tank. As before, I will double-click this operation to open it. In terms of duration, we need to pair this operation's duration to that of the transfer out operation from the previous procedure, since the transfer to the storage tank operation in P1 and the receive from mix tank operation in P2 will take the same amount of time. To pair this duration, we need to use the option duration equal to another operation or sequence of operations. Furthermore, we need to specify the procedure that we would like to pair it with, which is P1, and the operation within that procedure that we would like to pair it with, which is transfer to storage. In terms of scheduling, we need to pair this operation to the start of the transfer out in P1, since both operations will be carried out simultaneously. To specify this scheduling sequence, we first need to select the option with respect to an operation in another procedure. Then we need to specify the reference operation, transfer to storage, within procedure P1. This selection can be confirmed by double-clicking the transfer to storage operation here. In addition, we must change the link relation to starts with start of reference operation. This will force our receive from mix tank operation in procedure P2 to start at the same time as the transfer to storage operation in procedure P1. Now we can proceed to the next operation, feed filler. For this operation, we need to match its duration to the duration of the filling operation. This is done using the same option as before, duration equal to another operation or sequence of operations. In addition, we must choose the specific operation whose duration we would like to match. In this case, it is the fill bags operation in procedure P3. It's important to mention that although the duration of fill bags has not been specified yet, the durations of feed filler in P2 and fill bags in P3 can be matched already. This duration will be updated with the proper value once we specify the duration of the fill bags operation in procedure P3. 
In terms of scheduling, we can leave the default option since this operation follows the previous one. Let's now proceed on to the final operation for this procedure, the cleaning operation. For this operation, we need to specify a duration of 90 minutes. We also need to declare the use of an auxiliary CIP skid. As for scheduling, the default option is the correct one. Let's now click OK to finalize the initialization of this procedure. Notice again how the columns in the operation table have been updated to reflect the parameters that we just entered. Next, let's initialize the operations in procedure P3. Starting with the operation Fill Bags, we need to specify the duration based on a filling rate. To do that, we need to deselect the default option, which is based on a constant duration, and instead select the rate base term. When we do this, the Setup button becomes active. As a result, we can click the Setup button to specify the appropriate information. For this procedure, we will use a rate of 30 entities per minute. Each entity is defined as a 1 liter bag. Therefore, the first step we must take is to change the rate basis to Entities Flow Furthermore, we need to specify the rate in the appropriate box. In terms of entities processed, we are dealing with a 10,000 liter batch, which is therefore equivalent to 10,000 individual 1 liter entities. Let's now click OK to exit this dialog. Notice how the program now calculates the total nominal duration based upon the total amount of product and the processing rate. Continuing on to scheduling, we need to pair the start of this operation with the start of the operation Feed Filler in P2. To do this, select the option with respect to an operation in another procedure. Then select the Feed Filler operation within procedure P2. Double-click the operation to finalize this selection. As before, we will also need to change the link relation to the option Starts with Start of Reference Operation. This will force the Fill Bags operation in Procedure P3 to start at the same time as the Feed Filler operation in Procedure P2. Next, let's continue on to the last operation, Clean Filler. Here we need to specify a duration of 90 minutes. In terms of scheduling, the default option is the correct one, so no changes need to be made here. This finalizes the definition of the 1 liter bag recipe. Recipes can be visualized with a Gantt chart that is brought up by first selecting the recipe and then clicking on the Gantt chart button in the right side window. The Gantt chart can be displayed at various levels of detail. In this chart, the light brown bar represents the full recipe. The dark blue bars represent the individual procedures, and the light blue bars represent the operations within each procedure. Notice that the transfer to storage operation in procedure P1 and the receive from mix tank operation in procedure P2 operate in parallel and have the same duration. This is consistent with the information that we specified earlier. The same is true for feed filler in P2 and fill bags in P3. Likewise, the clean tank operation in P2 is matched with the clean filler operation in P3. Furthermore, through this Gantt chart you can access the properties of any operation by simply double-clicking it, as I will do now. You can then make changes to the operation, such as changing the duration or start time. Now that we are finished defining the recipe, we are ready to add campaigns. Campaigns are defined as a series of batches of a given recipe. In Schedule Pro, each scheduled batch represents the realization of a recipe at a given point in time with the use of specific equipment and resources. Unless otherwise stated by the user, the only constraint that Schedule Pro takes into account in generating a schedule is the availability of equipment and facilities. To add a campaign, first select the Production Schedule branch of the project tree. Then click on the Add New Campaign button in the Campaign Sequence pane of the Production Schedule view. This brings up the Campaign Setup dialog. 
There are several tabs in this dialog. In the ID Amount tab, you can set the campaign name, the associated recipe, which can be selected from the drop-down list, and the number of batches. In addition, if a reference batch size has been specified for the recipe, the number of batches in the scale factor indirectly determine the order amount. Alternatively, you can directly specify the order amount and let Schedule Pro calculate the required number of batches. For this example, let's set the number of batches to 4. Through the Time Sequencing tab, you can set the campaign start mode. In other words, you can specify if the campaign is to start immediately on the specified release date, or after the start or end of another campaign, as well as various other options. For this example, we will schedule the campaign with the default release date option. Furthermore, in the Options tab, you can specify the batch start options. By default, the batches of a campaign are scheduled based on the minimum cycle time of the recipe, which is determined by the scheduling bottleneck equipment. In addition, you have the option to set a larger cycle time or a slack time. The slack time is defined as the idle time between batches for the time bottleneck equipment. Let's now press OK to exit this dialog and add the campaign. Notice how the newly defined campaign appears in the campaign sequence list. Here you can see the campaign name, the recipe that the campaign is using, the number of batches, the amount, and the start time for this campaign. With the campaign definition complete, we are now ready to generate a production schedule. To do that, click on the Schedule All Campaigns button on the main toolbar. Notice that the production schedule window now displays the batches that have been scheduled, along with their start and end times. It also displays information on possible conflicts encountered while creating the schedule. This concludes Part 2 of this video tutorial series. Please make sure to watch Part 3, where I will discuss the results of this schedule along with other features.